So our keynote pre uh, presentation this year will be delivered by Dr. Lisa Federer from the National Library of Medicine. And we are so thrilled that she said yes to our invitation. I know a lot of us are curious about the new data policy at the NIH. So we're really excited to hear about uh, hear her presentation. Uh, give a quick intro. Uh, Dr. Lisa Federer is a data science and open science librarian at the National Library of Medicine and recently assumed the role of acting director of the NLM Office of Strategic Initiatives. In these roles, Dr. Federer focuses on developing efforts to support workforce development and enhance capacity in the biomedical research and library communities for data science and open science. Prior to joining NLM, she spent five years as a research data informationist at the National Institutes, Institutes of Health Library, where she developed and ran the library's data services program. Dr. Federer holds a PhD in information studies from the University of Maryland and an MLIS, MLIS from the University of California, Los Angeles, as well as graduate certificates in data science and data visualization. When she's not geeking out over data, she is most likely hanging out with her most awesome dog, Ophelia, reading a book or watching a good movie and knitting a sweater or skiing if it's cold enough. So for this presentation, Lisa is gonna talk for about 30 minutes. Then we'll have time for a Q and A. Uh, so please use the chat if you have any questions and we'll submit any unanswered questions to Lisa for follow-up afterwards, uh, depending on how much interest we have. Uh, so Lisa, I'll stop sharing my screen here, and you can share yours. Thanks. So thank you very much uh, for that introduction, and thank you to the organizing committee for the invitation to be here. Really happy to have this opportunity to speak with all of you about um, this new policy that I'm sure you've heard about and uh, share some more info with you and also talk a little bit about some of the opportunities that are available uh, for libraries and institutional repositories in this space as the policy moves forward. So in the session today, I'd like to give a little bit of background to the policy and uh, the broader culture of data sharing at NIH, talk a little bit about the policy, what that includes and what that entails, and then, like I said, talk um, about some of the roles for librarians and institutional repositories in helping to support the uh, rollout of the policy at their institutions and um, hoping to leave plenty of time for Q&A to get to your questions. So, uh, as I said, I want to start with a little bit of background for uh, the history of data sharing at NIH. NIH um, does have a mission to um, advance health and reduce illness and disability and recognizes that data sharing is essential for expediting the translation of research results into knowledge, which then are uh, findings that we can take to actually improve human health. And so for that reason, NIH has long uh, held that the results and accomplishments of the activities that NIH funds should be made available to the research community and the public at large. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of this, but uh, this is a timeline that highlights some of the significant developments in NIH's culture of data sharing over the last couple of decades. Um, NIH did have a data sharing policy that went into effect in 2003 and that is currently in effect until this new one goes into place in uh, January of next year. That policy only applied to um, larger grants, um, whereas this new one, as I'll discuss, will apply to all NIH funding. Uh, NIH also launched a public access policy that some of you may be familiar with in 2008, which states that um, publications must be made available to uh, freely to the public. Uh, and then there was also a genomic data sharing policy that went into place in 2014 that applies to large scale uh, genomic data, human and non human, um, and a few other things along the way that um, show our dedication to making uh, NIH funded research available to the public. So, with that backdrop of where we're coming from, let's talk a little bit about what's next with the NIH data management and sharing policy. So, this policy, as I alluded to, uh, does apply to all research funded by the NIH that generates scientific data. That includes extramural grants and contracts. It also includes intramural research projects. Uh, if you're not familiar, the NIH does send about 80% of its funding out to institutions like yours for uh, uh, supporting research and other activities. But we do have um, researchers here at the NIH 
um, that is our intramural research program, and so this applies to them as well. Um, and then any other NIH funding mechanisms. So, uh, for example, there's a funding type of other transaction, um, and so this applies to all of those as well. Uh, one thing that this does not apply to is funding that does not generate data. So, things like training grants or um, core facilities or infrastructure. Uh, not generating data, so obviously they don't have any data to share, so this does not apply to them. Um, and by the way, I've put links in uh, many of my slides for uh, additional information if you'd like to dig into this a little bit further. Um, and I think probably the slides will be shared. I'm happy to share them. Um, so if you want to follow up on any of that later, uh, lots of information available. So the policy requires the submission of a data management and sharing plan with uh, the application. And this plan should outline how scientific data, as well as accompanying metadata and other related uh, digital research objects like software or code will be managed and shared. Um, also, the plan should identify any potential restrictions or limitations that relate to sharing, which I'll talk a little bit more about. And once uh, the plan is accepted and the uh, award is given, Compliance with this plan um, as approved by the NIH um, ICO, which is Institute uh, Center or Office, will become part of the terms and conditions of the grant. So it is expected that uh, people will actually do what they say that they will do in their plan. There are six elements of a data management and sharing plan, which I'll talk a little bit about. And again, um, the uh, website and uh, the policy announcement go into more detail on all of these if you'd like to dig a little bit more. Um, but as a general overview, uh, the data management and sharing a plan must include a description of the data that is going to be generated during the study, along with the metadata and documentation that goes with that data. Uh, related tools like software and code that would need to uh, be available to access or use the data. Uh, identification of standards for the data and metadata, uh, description of the data preservation process, um, how access will be provided and associated timelines, so when will the data be shared and for how long, uh, access distribution and reuse considerations that may apply to the data, and then finally oversight of data management and sharing, so who is going to be um, in charge of making sure that the uh, activities that are described in the plan actually are carried out. So to talk a little bit more about each of these, um, the data description should include several different pieces, the type and amount of data that will be collected or used. So what type of data are we dealing with? Is this imaging, genomic, survey, um, a spreadsheet, whatever the data is, um, as well as whether the raw or process data will be shared, um, what data out of what is collected will be shared, and rationale for any data that are not shared uh, for things like legal or ethical reasons, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, also, a description of what metadata and documentation will be included to facilitate interpretation of that data. So this might include metadata standards, it might include things like study protocols or code books that help to contextualize and understand the information, um, data collection instruments, these sorts of things. So what does count as data for sharing? Um, this should be data that is adequate to validate and replicate the study findings. And importantly, um, this is not just data that results in a publication. Uh, NIH recognizes that some data from NIH funded, funded studies do not necessarily end up in a publication. So for example, null findings that um, you know, don't merit a publication potentially. And even if there's not a publication, there is still the expectation that data resulting from the study would still be shared. I did mention that there are some acceptable reasons to not share data. Um, I think a lot of people get concerned when they think about sharing data because they have this expectation that it means that the information in the data is just freely available, no controls, um, no, no restrictions, and that's really not the case. Uh, there are many studies at the NIH funds, of course, that deal with potentially sensitive human data. And so uh, NIH does recognize that there are, in certain scenarios, uh, important limitations on sharing. This might have to do with the informed consent uh, that participants have completed for the study. Uh, for example, if this is an ongoing study and there are participants that have already previously been consented and that consent did not include 
um, specific, um, you know, acknowledgement of the fact that the data could be shared. Um, of course, not appropriate to make that data available. Uh, there are also times that it's not possible to adequately de-identify data and to ensure that um, that data would not be re-identified and potentially place the research participants um, in uh, risk of harm or re-identification. So in those types of scenarios, of course, um, not, not appropriate to share the data. Uh, sometimes there might be federal, state, local, or tribal laws or policies that prohibit disclosure. Uh, HIPAA is one example of a policy that might uh, come into play here. And then this does only apply to digital data. So um, anything that cannot be made digital with reasonable efforts would not um, be something that would be expected to be shared. So the next section is the related tools, software, and code. And this would include a description of any specialized tools that are needed to access the data, um, as well as names of specific software tools. So um, is the um, code written in something like Python or R, or does the analysis and access to the data rely on a specific uh, proprietary software tool like SAS or SPSS, um, as well as addressing the availability of tools, whether they are open source, and made freely available for people or whether it's something that has to be purchased. Another consideration here is, um, will this tool be around to access the data for as long as the data is available? Um, especially for something like a homegrown um, you know, software or code, it, that may be something that requires ongoing maintenance of the code to make sure that it still is available to people. And so um, the plan should address how the tools will be um, made available to people to make sure that they can still access that data for as long as it's available. The next section is standards. Um, and this is something that I think a lot of librarians can bring to the table to help researchers with this. Um, this might include things like addressing data formats, um, data dictionaries, whether the study will involve the use of common data elements, which are uh, basically standardized ways of asking questions and defining uh, variables, um, identifiers that will be used with the data, such as a digital object identifier or DOI, um, any definitions that might be important. And then if there is no consensus standard, um, as is the case in some fields, especially emerging fields, um, that would be described in this section. The next section is data preservation, access, and timelines. Um, and this would be definitely a place where um, institutional repositories may come into play uh, because the researcher is asked to name the repository or repositories uh, where data will be shared, as well as addressing the findability and identifiability of that data. So it's not really adequate to put the data on a website where no one's going to find it, um, more desirable to put it in a repository that has um, search functionality and has the ability to apply unique identifiers. Um, this section, as I said, will also address when the data will be shared. The expectation is that it would be no later than the time of publication for data that are associated with, um, with a publication or uh, for other data not associated with a publication by the end of the performance period of the funding. Um, and then how long the data is anticipated to be available. Um, the NIH has not provided specific guidance on the length of time that data should be uh, made available. And I think that's partly because NIH funds so many different kinds of research. It's really difficult to be very prescriptive about certain things like naming a specific repository or specifying how long data is going to be available because those practices and uh, appropriate repositories will likely vary quite a lot across the you know, many different disciplines that the NIH funds. So in a lot of cases, um, these things are a, a bit open-ended, um, and uh, I think researchers will need some assistance in finding what is most appropriate for their particular use case. Um, next is access distribution and reuse considerations. Um, this should address how um, participants will be informed and consent to the sharing of their data address any privacy and confidentiality protections, and um, address any of those restrictions that we've talked about that might be um, related to federal, state, uh, tribal, or other uh, regulations. 
And then finally, um, the oversight of the data management and sharing plan, how compliance with the plan will be monitored and managed, who will be responsible for oversight and how often those oversight activities will occur. So how will uh, the, the team ensure that uh, they are able to carry out what's described in the plan and make their data available? Uh, so this plan will be submitted with applications. Um, it will include a budget justification as well. In terms of assessment, um, the NIH program officer will be the one that assesses the plans. Peer reviewers for the uh, proposals may comment on, but not score the budget section of the plan. Um, and importantly, plans can be updated. So, uh, you know, NIH recognizes that things may change. Um, what is planned at the very beginning of a potentially multi-year project may end up having to change. And so in collaboration and coordination with the program officer, plans can be updated as needed. As I mentioned, um, compliance with the plan does become part of the terms and conditions of the funding and will be monitored at regular reporting intervals that are um, things that our researchers are already doing um, in terms of reporting uh, at various points on their project. So this will be tied to that. And compliance may factor into future funding decisions, not just for the individual researcher, but also for the institution. So um, very important that what is outlined in, this, in these plans is actually carried out. So that is an overview of the policy. And now I wanna talk about the roles for librarians and institutional repositories in this, uh, which I think will be of interest to you. So one area where I think researchers can use some help and that I think this audience will probably have some useful insight into is what um, costs they should be asking for. So they can ask for uh, to carry out things like data curation and de development of the documentation, um, local data management during the life of the project, and then long-term preservation and sharing in a repository after the project. Um, but a lot of researchers may not know what does that look like? What does that cost? Um, so one resource that I would suggest um, is the report that um, NLM actually funded through the National Academies a few years ago on forecasting costs for preserving, archiving, and promoting access to biomedical data. Um, this study prevents a frame, presents a framework for thinking about what are the different costs associated with data throughout its life cycle. Um, I'll also point to this checklist that the study put out um, for administrators at research institutions, but I think this is very applicable to librarians and institutional repositories as well. Um, it is a checklist for basically how to get people at the institution thinking about um, data sharing and costs um, and what what needs to be done to um, help help expand the capacity to make decisions about funding for data management. Um, so I think a really helpful resource there. Uh, I will also say that um, funding can be used to support the things that we've seen here, um, active data management during the project as well as data sharing after. This may be something that institutional repositories could um, benefit from in terms of funding. Uh, a couple limitations there. One is that uh, the funding cannot be used for things that are already included in overhead. So if, for example, the library funds an institutional repository and um, some of the overhead costs from the grant go to the library to do that, uh, be sort of double dipping to ask for funds for that. But if that's not the case, um, funding could potentially be included for that. Um, and also another limitation to be aware of here is that the uh, funding, the expenditures have, have to happen during the period of performance for the grant or contract. So if the data is going to be made available for, you know, X number of years, five, 10 years, whatever, um, and there's a yearly cost associated with that, that can't be paid down the line after the project is already over. So there would have to be consideration of how those costs might be paid up front um, during the period of performance. So when it comes to selecting a repository, uh, this is an area where I think there's a lot of opportunity for institutional repositories. NIH does encourage the use of subject specific and open access data repositories um, as a first choice when those are available, but we know that there's not always um, an appropriate repository for every particular data set. 
So there are um, options to uh, have other other places to put data that doesn't um, have a natural home in a subject specific repository. Um, PubMed Central, which is the open access uh, repository of publications for the NIH, will take uh, related data sets up to two gigabytes. Um, there are the option for generalist repositories for um, so those mid-sized data sets. Um, there are several generalist repositories that the NIH works with through the generalist repository ecosystem initiative, which I'll talk a little bit more about. But this is also, um, I think, a great opportunity for institutional repositories to play a role here as well. Um, and then for the very large and high priority data sets, there is the STRIDES program, which is a partnership um, with the NIH and um, several of the large cloud storage providers, including Amazon uh, Web Services, uh, Google, and uh, Microsoft Azure. So when it comes to institutional repositories, um, I want to draw your attention to the desirable characteristics for data repositories that was put out by the Office of Science, Technolo Science and Technology Policy and also included as a supplement to the NIH data management and sharing policy. This um, set of desirable characteristics is uh, a set of 10 sort of ideals to aim for in repositories. This is intended to both help researchers to um, evaluate and assess repositories that they might be thinking about using. What should they be thinking about in terms of um, best practices and desirable characteristics? as well as for funders to um, make decisions about repositories that they would like to fund. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about each of these because I think this could be a great way for institutional repositories to start thinking about what do they need to do to make their repository more robust and um, uh, something that NIH funded researchers and other researchers can uh, feel confident about sharing their data with. Um, so one is that ideally the repository will provide persistent unique identifiers that would support data discovery and reporting. Um, these should be things that are citable. Uh, DOI is a great example, but there are other identifiers that may also be appropriate. Uh, the repository should have a long-term plan for managing data um, and a contingency for uh, contingency, yeah, contingency plan for unforeseen events. Um, so if we're going to put data in a repository, we want to make sure that that data is going to be around for um, as long as we need that data to be made available. Um, the repository should have appropriate metadata to enable discovery, reuse, and citation. What that metadata looks like may differ uh, depending on the type of repository or the type of data. Um, the repository should have some mechanism for curation and quality assurance to make sure that the data sets are accurate and um, the metadata is uh, complete and appropriate. Oops. Um, the repository should make data as open as possible, consistent with legal and ethical limits, and that should also be free um, to the data reuser. Some repositories may charge a fee for data depositors, um, but for people to reuse the data, there um, ideally should be no fee associated with that. There should be mechanisms in place that enable tracking of data reuse. This may be things like um, counts of views or downloads. This may be things like having a DOI that can be cited so that it can be tracked through um, mechanisms that are available for doing that. Um, the data sets and metadata should be able to be downloaded um, and accessed in a common format. Again, what this looks like will probably differ depending on the type of data. Um, and so, uh, you know, whatever is most appropriate should be used here. Um, the repository should also be secure and have documentation of how that security is in place to prevent unauthorized access to data. There should also be privacy safeguards and documentation of um, those safeguards in place, as well as how risk management and continuous monitoring will be carried out. And then there should also be a means for tracking provenance, um, having log files of changes to data sets and metadata to ensure integrity and also to uh, track changes and versioning of data sets in those repositories. <clears throat> 
Um, so I think those are 10 that really apply regardless of the type of data that you're looking at and I think are useful um, considerations for all repositories, um, including institutional repositories. The uh, plan or the policy also outlines nine additional considerations for repositories that house human data, which I think probably apply less to the types of repositories that we're talking about today, but I'll mention them um, so you are aware. Um, so, first is the fidelity to consent. Um, there are certain scenarios where a um, informed consent would uh, include a uh, limitation that data would only be used in a certain type of research. So, um, if I consent to my research or my data being used only in the context of, say, Alzheimer's research, we need to ensure that um, that uh, data is, is only used appropriately. Um, these repositories should be restricted use compliant and be able to enforce the restrictions that are necessary uh, for data based on the submitters uh, requirements. These repositories should also have um, probably a, you know, a higher level of privacy to ensure that, um, you know, since we are dealing with human subject data to make sure that uh, those data sets are not accessed in uh, an inappropriate way. Uh, there also needs to be clear guidance for restrictions on data set access and use. That may be, again, that um, informed consent piece, what the data can and cannot be used for, um, other restrictions that might be in place as to what the data can and cannot be used for. There should also be guidance and documentation on retention for the data. Um, it is probably the case that once you download it, it's not really appropriate to just keep it forever. Um, there's clear limitations generally on what the data can be used for and how it can be used. And so um, for security reasons, um, ideally that would not be retained indefinitely. And so guidance should be in place about um, that expectation. There should also be a mechanism for reviewing data use requests for uh, when people want to reuse this data. What is the mechanism for that oversight to ensure that the um, or requests that come in are appropriate for the use of the data. And then in terms of some of the security um, features, the uh, repository should have a plan for um, what happens if there is a data breach and how they'll respond to that. Uh, control and audit of downloads, so knowing who has accessed data and when. And then uh, plans in place for uh, what happens if somebody does violate the terms of use, um, how will that be dealt with? So again, I think these are things that probably are not going to be considerations for institutional repositories because I think these are more specialized um, repositories that will be dealing with human data. Um, but again, I make you aware of them as part of um, the guidance that was provided from those um, characteristics. Uh, and finally, I want to talk a little bit about the NIH Generalist Repository Ecosystem Initiative, or GRAY. Um, this is an activity that has brought um, applications from generalist repositories um, to work together on some activities, including implementing consistent capabilities um, across these various repositories, creating better access to and discovery of NIH-funded data, so making it easier for people to locate um, that NIH-funded data, also conducting um, outreach and training on fair data practices, so making researchers more aware of best practices for sharing data and engaging the research community on how to do this. The goals or um, desired outcomes of this activity would be to make it easier for researchers to share data. Um, ideally, if we're going to require people to share data, it should be easy for them to do that. Um, also improve discoverability of that data once it is out there. And um, the, those things will also have the outcome of increasing the reproducibility of research by making that data available and encouraging secondary reuse of the data. So once that data is collected, um, it is you know, great if we can reuse that um, in other cases where appropriate. Um, so I'll say a little bit more about the objectives of Gray. Um, the, I would say a big one is this bottom middle bullet point, which is the commitment to coopetition, which is the notion that there are areas where these repositories are in competition with each other, um, but there are areas where there is the opportunity co to collaborate and cooperate on certain things, um, many of which are described here. So uh, some of the activities that 
these repositories have been working on are things like developing consistent metadata models that each repository could adopt, um, which would help enable federated search across repositories. Um, the development of educational materials and outreach um, and developing use case um, use cases that they would like to support. So what are the things that NIH funded researchers um, and other stakeholders want to be able to do? And what activities do the repositories need to engage in to um, help facilitate that? So I mentioned this because I think that what comes out of Gray um, will have a lot of implications for institutional repositories, potentially. Um, things like if there is a consistent metadata model that all of these repositories are adopting, um, it may be worth other repositories like institutional repositories considering how they can align with that as well. Um, the implementation of open metrics is another piece where I think institutional repositories could um, benefit from some of the lessons learned in um, this initiative. Um, I realize I left out the slide that actually names all of the repositories that are part of Gray, so I will try to list them off. Um, so Harvard Dataverse, Figshare, Dryad, um, Mendeley Data, Zenodo, oh no, I'm forgetting two. Um, they're listed on the site, <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, and I am really sorry to the two that I've forgotten. Um, but with that, I will stop there and be happy to take any questions. Thank you, OSF and Vivli. Yes, thank you so much. Those are the other two. All right. Thank you, Dr. Federer, for that presentation. That was incredibly informative. Um, could you do me a favor and stop sharing your screen? Yes. And we have a few questions for you. you know, one of my colleagues was collecting, um, collecting questions. Yeah, I'll start with the um, first one. Um, Thank you, uh, and it was kind of a general open question to anybody who wanted to pop in, but uh, does anyone have a good reference for NIH thoughts on the timing conundrum for when the end of the performance period happens before the publication is accepted or published? So with the, I don't I don't know um, if there's any specific guidance from the NIH on this. I will say um, I did not mention this in my slides, but I will mention the um, website sharing.nih.gov is a really useful resource for all things related to the policy. Um, so you may find more information related to that um, there. Um, there's some FAQs and some other guidance, so um, definitely recommend that sharing.nih.gov site as a resource for um, finding things related to that. But I would say generally in response to that, um, that again, the expectation is the end of the period of performance or the uh, publication of the you know, related article, whichever comes first. So if that publication does not come out until afterwards, I would think would be to um, share it by the end of the period of performance of the grant or contract. Great. Um, we just had another question come through. Um, it looks like it's about some of the gray repositories. Um, other than Figshare and Zenodo, are other platforms going to provide mechanisms to anom anonymize data sets that need to be submitted to journals for blind review? Okay, so I think the question is, so um, when you are submitting, you may have to, uh, submitting a paper, you may have to have like a data availability statement that points out where the data is shared. Some reviewers want to actually see um, that data before um, they, you know, as part of their peer review. Um, so as the um, question noted, Figshare and Zenodo do this, um, Open Science Framework also um, has support for this. I think several of the generalist repositories do. Um, this is, you know, a, a definitely a recognized use case that, you know, there may be scenarios where you do want to put your data in a repository and 
be able to give somebody a link to it, but you don't necessarily want it fully open to the world right away. Um, so definitely the generalist repositories do support that. Um, I'm not sure about subject specific repositories um, as far as that feature. Um, that's one really I more think of with the generalist repositories, but it may be that some um, subject specific repositories support that as well. Okay, great. Um, next question. If you are archiving data in your IR, do you recommend creating a specific data archiving policy? Interesting question. Um, I would say probably yes. I think um, thinking back to those desirable characteristics, um, a lot of them center around documentation of what happens with your data once it's in this repository. So I think that um, people putting data in a repository will feel that they can do so with more confidence if there's a clear um, policy outlined for archiving and, and what those practices look like. So um, it's not necessarily something that the NIH would require, but I think it's certainly a good practice and um, that having that transparency for users, I think is really helpful. Great. Um, all right. Next one, if someone received a no cost extension, does the extension end date become the new submission date? This is in reference to the previous question. Um, so if someone is rushing to get a manuscript published before funding period ends, they could apply for no cost extension. Right, so um, so I will, I will caveat this question or preface it, I guess, um, by saying that your best source for information for any specific question related to a particular grant or, or application um, will always be the NIH program officer. So um, I will answer this question, but I will say that this is the kind of thing that should always be discussed with the program officer. Um, my understanding, I am not a program officer myself, um, is that the no cost extension essentially just push, pushes back the end date um, of the activity. So anything that is expected to be wrapped up um, by the end of the period of performance, that deadline then changes to whatever the extension date is. So my um, opinion would be that, yes, if there is a no cost extension, that then um, extends the period into which um, the data must be submitted. Okay, great. All right, next question. How will NIH hold NIH intramural researchers accountable with the NIH data management and sharing policy? I would think that this effort would help support extramural re researchers learning and making sure they are fully aligned with the DMSP. Will NIH library help with compliance checks, et cetera? Yeah, so um, the intramural researchers very similar to extramural researchers do have to have progress reports. Um, they have like a yearly report that they do that describes their research and what they've done. So um, my understanding is that that um, compliance tracking will happen during that um, existing reporting process. Um, I am no longer at the NIH library, but I talk to them quite a lot um, and I believe that they do have plans to um, help do some training and outreach to uh, the NIH community. In fact, I think they've already done some work on um, providing uh, training for that intramural research community. I'm not aware of what plans they have to actually be involved with, um, you know, tracking things or, or um, helping researchers, but they uh, do have a very excellent um, set of staff and a good data services program um, that I feel very confident will be uh, a good help to intramural researchers. Great. All right. Um, how do researchers choose between an IR and the NIH gray repositories? Um, it's uh, they reference a page. Um, the NIH explicitly states the preference of IRs over general generalist repositories. Is that still true, or has the position evolved as gray has evolved? Yeah, so I think um, this is a, a great question um, and one that I, I don't necessarily have like a firm answer to. I think that this is a very complex um, ecosystem of, of data and repositories, and there's not necessarily always, you know, 
a right choice for a repository. There may be a lot of repositories that would be equally appropriate. Um, institutional repositories definitely would be on that list. Um, I think there's great benefit to using institutional repositories, um, but the generalist repositories also have um, some features that may be desirable in certain cases. Um, so there is, um, I can grab a link to it later, or maybe somebody, we're, we're librarians here, I'm sure we can find it amongst us. <laughs> um, there is on Zenodo um, a generalist repository comparison chart that has various different um, characteristics about the repositories and they've responded on how they approach that characteristic. Um, and so I think this could be helpful for institutional repositories to think about what are some of the things that the generalist repositories are already thinking about and how they have experienced that users might, uh, information that users might want to know in making a selection of a repository. Um, but I, I absolutely think that, and the NIH recognizes that um, institutional rep repositories absolutely play a huge role here. Mm -hmm. I, I get the sense too a little bit as this whole policy has been evolving and a lot of service providers and um, people who run repositories, they seem to be adding on more um, data saving and sharing capabilities within their their infrastructure. So I think it's going to keep evolving as it goes. And um, maybe your IR isn't great for this policy right now, but in the future it might be. So it's evolving. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think this space is definitely one that is absolutely evolving, not only in terms of the repositories, but in terms of researchers' data practices and, and you know, they're learning more about how to do this and what the landscape looks like. And even the NIH policy is evolving and how, um, you know, we're, we're kind of learning along with everybody else what the important considerations are. Um, the program officers, you know, have, have had a lot of questions about how do we, what is best practice? And so um, internally at the NIH, there's been a lot of training and um, discussion about what, what program officers should be thinking about when they look at these plans. Okay, I think we're almost at time. I think maybe we've got time for one more question. Um, so it's, can you explain a little more about the STRIDES program? Can anyone with an NIH grant submit to these repositories? Can anyone even without an NIH grant submit? Yeah, so the STRIDES program is a very long acronym that I never remember what it stands for, but um, <laughs> it is a collaboration with these three cloud providers. And so um, there have been activities where some NIH data has moved to these. Um, so for example, SRA, which is um, an NCBI resource uh, is now in, in the cloud. Um, I think it's mirrored across all three providers. Um, for people that are funded by NIH, they can get a discount um, for uh, these cloud providers. So they still do have to pay for the cloud storage, um, but they get a discount through um, using the STRIDES program, and um, I believe that it is open to anyone that gets NIH funding, um, but that, again, would be a good question for a program officer, um, and they, I know, have more information on their um, site, the STRIDES team does, um, about who, who and how and all of that good stuff. Great. Um, all right, so actually, it looks like there's another question. I could piggyback off of that real quick. Um, many of our researchers with petabyte scale data are worried about costs beyond the life of the award. Are there ongoing costs associated with Google strides and other options listed for big data? If so, are there mecha mechanisms that someone can apply for to cover these costs beyond the life of the original award? Yeah, um, I'm not familiar with, you know, the pricing structure of these various different um, cloud providers, but I, I think that they're probably are ongoing costs. And I think that's something that, um, you know, could potentially be negotiated. I don't know if Strides has thought about, um, you know, addressing this, but yeah, there is that limitation that um, funding has to be expended um, during the period of performance. Okay. Um, well, thanks to everybody for their questions and thanks to Dr. Federer for her presentation. Um, Stephen, did you have anything to add? Um, no, that was just perfect timing. So we are ready for our first break. Um, so we will regroup at 1 o'clock Eastern time for our first session shopping slash starting 
your IR. Um, so we'll see you all then.